listeners, you are tuning in to the Difficult Conversations podcast series with me, Poppy Gerard Abbott, PhD researcher at the University of Edinburgh. And I am so excited today to be welcoming two guests who took part in a reading group series called Looking in the Mirror, which focused on white feminism and the role of feminists in the anti-racist and Black Lives Matter movement. So just to frame uh, that topic, we are obviously... um, Uh, We're having this conversation following on from well over a month of uh, BLM and anti-racist activism all around the world. And uh, this raises many questions for um, for feminists, um, especially for feminists who are white. The reading group series that we've recently have engaged with feminists all over the world uh, based on the text Me Not You by Professor Alison Phipps, which looks at... uh, Uh, how white supremacy is still centred within our feminist movements and pushing out uh, more marginalised women and women of colour. So today we're going to be confronting some of the questions that we asked during that reading series. And I'm just going to list a few of them to you now. So the first being uh, how much of our activism is um, focused on not appearing racist and sanitizing ourselves of our own whiteness. So when we rush to social media to support Black Lives Matter uh, or to donate or um, post an anti-racist uh, status, how much of that um, is deflecting from painful um, reflection on the roles that we all play um, in systems of white supremacy. So, for example, we can, um, you know, make a post on Facebook about how we support the movement, but then we still uh, purchase from racist supply chains. Uh, We may still take a promotion over a a, a colleague of colour, and we may still be engaging in feminist activism that is uh, pushing out marginalised groups such as uh, trans people and uh, and people of colour. So today we're, we're kind of concerned with um, this tick box approach um, and the, ticks, the tick box approaches that we see within the rallies and protests going on uh, all around us. So have a think about it as, as white people, as white feminists, how much do you kind of parachute into these rallies and parachute out and think, yep, I've ticked that box. I've done that self-reflection about my own whiteness. Um, but how much have we actually dismantled ourselves and how radical is that dismantlement of our own uh, Um, our own white supremacy and the systems in which we we benefit from as white people. I think uh, our responses to these questions are particularly complex as we are existing in a technologized world where social media is a wall of of white noise, figuratively and literally. And we can feel highly pressured as as activists, as feminists, as allies to take immediate action to, again, uh, not appear racist, posting black squares and so on, Um, especially with this kind of silence is is violence narrative or silence is complicity narrative. But is this narrative um, particularly um, true? Um, Should we be focusing on uh, kind of bearing witness to the events and to distributing our wealth or taking other more radical actions rather than um, engaging in these tick box approaches, which um, which sanitize ourselves of uh, of much more um, painful and complex reflection? And finally, um, I want us to be thinking about what is the extent of our solidarity? Um, So, you know, we'd be willing to go to a BLM protest in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic And we will bring COVID-19 into this conversation because this podcast was born um, from um, the pandemic. So um, it focuses on um, engaging in sociological critiques and feminist critiques of the pandemic. So, you know, would we be willing to look um, after somebody who is sick as a result of the the protests um, and other gatherings that are going on? Who and what feeds into our calculations of solidarity? You know, again, would we be willing to distribute our income or take more radical steps? Steps, or are we just interested in these um, parachute in, parachute out um, approaches? So there is just so much to to talk about, um, and obviously we will also be. Um, uh, engaging in conversation about the emotional and psychological processes of engaging in the um, looking in the mirror reading groups, as well as the kind of intellectual and academic side. So I'd like to welcome Faye and Amy to the conversation today. Um, and I'd like to put the question to you both. We'll start off really broad, but it does intersect in, into all of the other questions that I'm going to ask you. And um, what does it mean to be a feminist to you? How did you come to the feminist table? 
Hi, so I'm Faye. My background is a degree in psychology. But other than that, I don't have any education when it comes to uh, feminism or anything. And I think I came to the feminism game quite late. My initial feminism didn't come under the label of feminism because I think I was young and naive and not necessarily educated on what it meant to be a feminist. It was just the societal and media portrayal of what being a feminist was. And that was, you know, an angry woman. And that was bad. And it was kind of internalized misogyny, really, on a basic level. And over the years, it's evolved and I've educated myself and I've um, started reading more feminist literature just on my own basis. I've started having conversations with friends and it kind of came as something I wanted to actively look into the more I realised that I was um, arguing against rape culture and conversations with friends and didn't largely have the media to back myself up. And then through that, it's just been looking at events and activities that I can join that mean I can listen to other women's voices and their empowerment and take that on myself and further, you know, fight the fight. Um, and it kind of initially started off as just reading feminist literature that I was interested in. And then I kind of thought I need to make sure that I'm looking at a wider platform. So I started reading more on like um, the book, Can We All Be Feminists, which is largely about intersectional feminism. And when I was reading that, it kind of struck me that a lot of the issues that I argued against on a very vocal level were very minor compared to other women suffering in that I can't call myself a feminist unless I'm going to be willing to fight for people who have um, a lesser voice and that their issues kind of take precedent when it comes to, you know, I'm just being labelled as feminine, but they can't vote. They're being forced to marry people. Um, and just making sure, really, that I look at it from all angles. And I probably don't do it as much as I should. But that's kind of, yeah, the story of my feminism up until now. Thanks so much, Faye. It's so interesting to hear how um, people's feminism has matured over the years. And that often involves, um, you know, again, painful reflections on um, how we can dominate feminism and, you know, who are we excluding and leaving out from the feminist picture? Thanks so much um, for that. Amy, would you now like to um, share with our listeners um, how your feminism has, has grown from its kind of original place to a more intersectional place now? Um, yeah, um, I think very similar to Faye, it, it, I, w I, w I was a feminist early on without realizing it, largely because I was challenging, you know, tr traditional notions around me. Um, and for me, that started off really young, like, you know, the idea of, uh, I was told really, really quite young, I, I, my goal was to get married and have children and to make my future husband happy. And I remember being fully, you know, challenge, just challenging that whole notion, well, my brother's got to do this, why can't I do it? And just frankly being told, you can't because you're a girl. And, um, and that's because I grew up in a very machismo Latino environment. Um, and so from, I think my onset was always just to challenge these things I wasn't allowed to do because I was a girl and I, there, there were different expectations of me blatantly because of my gender. Um, and as I got older and I started challenging the notions of what I refer to as a, as a feminine gospel, that we're supposed to do this and we're supposed to do that and, and moving into dating and, and, and maturing into what I would eventually discover to be my femininity and something to be proud of. That's when I started realizing that I was challenging, um, and I think maybe from a different standpoint for most people, I was challenging kind of the women's gospel, which is fundamentally white women and the idea ideology that white, you know, really privileged women and Christian women, particularly from the U.S., maintain, and this notion that you're supposed to like go on eight dates until until you're not and until you're really sure this person isn't the one, even though he treats you wrong, and you're not supposed to do this, and you're not supposed to do this, date a man with money, and and really finding kind of the, these kind of weird cruxes of femininity within the performance performance of us in our interactions with others. So for me, it started off from that space and then moving into 
the studies on feminism themselves in academia, because grow, me growing up in a masculine environment, I was kind of inundated and, um, and more or less taught to look at things from a very masculine perspective. So when I came across gender studies, I, I had a very stereotypical notion of what feminism was, at least this overt, you know, misrepresentation of kind of mad women. Um, and then when I started teaching it, I realized that the data was absolutely accurate, that it was more than, quote, mad women. It was women in general and different, different uh, agendas within the feminist argument. So I thought I realized that there was this kind of matrix of understandings that I was accurate about, but yet in, uh, uninformed about other things. And I find myself constantly straddling that 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 kind of knowledge wave. If there's a way of saying that, and find myself in academic circles still kind of fundamentally doing that, coming from this place of of, of valuing um, male influences in my life and valuing um, Latino influences in my life. And at the same time, hearing this white influence and hearing the feminine direction and seeing that it, is, that ha it has its own ideologies as, as great as it is, it's, it's challenging um, the status quo. So I find myself evolving with that through my education through my activism, but it did, it start, it started from a very benign place of in my own family and to chat to performing my femininity and then exploring those, uh, those notions through my research in academia itself. Thanks so much, Amy. That's so interesting. I'm going to cling on to that concept. Um, the feminine gospel. Yeah. girl. Yeah. <laughs> so I assume that kind of refers to the kind of heteronormative trajectory that women are meant to follow so yeah reproduction and marriage and taking care of the family and community so interesting thank you um thanks so much amy yeah so we're now going to be turning to the politics of allyship by referring back to um both of your engagement in the reading group series looking in the mirror um, so it aimed to literally get us to look in the mirror at our own feminist politics and allyship. Um, how did you both find the process of engaging in the reading group? So put down the intellectual for a second and um, connect with the emotional. I, I found myself um, after reading the Me Not You text by Alison Phipps feeling very defensive, you know, well, I've done that. So why should I um, be suffering or be burdened with this, this guilt and uh, be made to do this painful self-reflection if other people aren't? And uh, there were so many powerful parts of the book um, that really got my back up. So um, I'd love to hear what your emotional experience was. So I kind of felt ashamed because there was so much in it that didn't, you know, cross my mind just on an instinct level that it would with other feminist issues and that there was just so much in there that I didn't know or that I wasn't aware of um, because everybody's heard of the Me Too movement, but I wasn't aware that a person of colour was one who originated it and that there was a foundation before there was a hashtag. And, yeah, it just made me feel like I was wrong to think I was a good feminist um, because I was like, oh, you know, I, I go to talks on honour killings. I educate myself on, you know, issues. And I've read a book about intersectionality. But really, how far is that going? You know, going to an occasional talk and occasionally picking up a book about intersectionality when I can read one article and just be completely bombarded with all of this information that I was ignorant to. Um, so it was quite a, not taxing, but challenging emotionally to read it because there's so much you've got to accept about yourself that you weren't necessarily aware of before. Okay, can you go a bit deeper there? So what did you find in particular to be very challenging or taxing, as you say? So kind of the background of a lot of the civil rights movements, how they've come from um, people of colour and that it's, um, uh, that was it as well, the statue of the um, feminist in Parliament Square, um, that was kind of, challenging to read because on the one hand you want to celebrate the fact that we've got a feminist figure as a statue but at the same time she was racist and 
her her terminology was largely putting down a group of women and using their suffering to kind of elevate her own and sum it up and it was kind of like on what on what side do I fall on this because I want to celebrate this you know celebration of a woman suffragette but at the same time there was so much racism in the suffragette movement and that's something that's such a big part of our feminist movement I think that's so hard, right? All of these, if you look back, all of these campaigns or initiatives that we've supported as um, as feminists who um, who are white, you know, we may have supported uh, Me Too and yes, the erection of um, of women statues, historical female um, figures, um, getting women on um, UK banknotes, um, so many movements that actually have and, and historical figures that actually have roots in racism and white supremacy that we've celebrated over the years. I've, I also found that a particularly uh, painful lesson um, during the reading groups and, you know, in relation to reading the Me Not, to, Me Not You um, text, um, FIPS highlights all of the campaigns that um, have many racist elements to them and how can it be feminist if it's, if it's racist. Thank you, Faye. Um, Amy, how did you find um, engaging in the reading groups and the text Me Not You? Um, I, I love the reading groups. I love, I love engaging in all this type of stuff. Cause I get to, as a sociologist, I get to hear, um, and particularly someone who has a history interviewing women, um, about their experiences. I love hearing these, these types of positions, regardless of whether or not I'm comfortable with it. Um, so I, um, I, I've said before in, in other reading groups, I'm a, I'm a biracial woman, I'm a mixed woman. And, and so I, I straddle this line between brown and whiteness and I pass in many, in, in certain spaces and other spaces I don't. And growing up around brown and white people, I, I had a very d distinct notion and a very heightened notion of what it meant, what racism looked like and what it meant, and yet not experiencing overt forms of it and yet witnessing overt forms of it, even from members of my own family. So the text to me wasn't necessarily surprising because I've always been educated from those perspectives from, from the brown side of my family and growing up in urban environments and growing around, up around racial minorities. So I wasn't surprised by anything I, I, I read, to be frank, simply because we're exposed to those things all the time. And we're, we always hear the, the, white, the white argument. And I hear the white argument even within my own family members and, 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 the, and, the, and kind of the white silence and the white blindness to it as well. And not being able to even combat that within my own family because they, they're they're, they're, they're have their positions and they're stuck in their positions and they're unwilling, at least members of my family, family are, are willing to, dis to disclose or dis discuss or critique those positions themselves because that's a you know, position of their, of their, of their superiority. Um, so for me, I, I, it was kind of redundant and that's my position largely because I've been exposed to it my entire life. And as an academic, I'm exposed to these things on a regular basis and I engage with it on a regular basis. Um, but being in, in, in the reading groups and hearing white people and white women in particular talk about confronting their their own their own um uh, lackiness and allyship and white silence and the uncomfortableness of it is something that i rarely hear if anything it's always the dismissiveness of it it's always well that's not happening it's always well we care about diversity because women are in the room and it's always well a very a very obviously a very select version of diversity and it's gender oriented and it's and it's usually a very specific type of gender so hearing it to me was and hearing that discomfort just I think reverberated a lot of the things racial minorities already understand, and it's like, well, welcome to our world. You're 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 supposed to be uncomfortable because we're uncomfortable all the time, and you have the privilege to leave the moment. But to hear you attempt to situate yourself in it, and to hear a bunch of white women discuss that moment, and in in its in its vulnerability and in and in and in its uncomfortableness, to me was something at least for the time being a little bit reassuring because it means you 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 want to do the hard work and you don't know how to do the hard work and those more educated know not to ask you know people of color how do we do this because it's well that's your path just like we had to figure out our, our path but we can have some, some collaboration so to hear that was to me a little bit enlightening and um and, and the attempt is something I encourage and it's something that should be there should be more open dialogue for so I, I heavily support what you're doing Poppy and having these very difficult conversations which is the lovely title of your podcast and they're necessary and there needs to be 
um, a space to have these conversations. And I do the same things in my classes where we talk about privilege or underprivileged, whatever whatever space that may come from, or even that, that matrix of in between, it's like me. Um, and that's something I stress to my students. We're going to have discussions about these things. And it's not supposed to be comfortable because if you're comfortable, that means you're staying where you are. And all of us are going to have to confront what this means. And if we're not going to have a discussion, we're not going to move forward. And we can't essentially move towards action, which is the goal. So um, what I, and, and so I fundamentally support what's going on and hearing that I think was a little bit reassuring. If you're uncomfortable for a moment, that means you're, you're doing something right in that moment. And the, I think the next focus would be to, to act on that. Yes, I was really surprised at the scale in which people admitted after engaging in the reading groups, how uncomfortable and defensive they felt from reading the text and engaging in the discussion. And I really welcomed that. Um, but one of the things that kind of doesn't sit quite right with me in terms of the um, running and, and chairing the reading groups is that um, FIP says in uh, Me Not You that uh, we're swimming in this sea of white supremacy and it's so uh, rooted within, uh, within ourselves, within our psyche and our outlooks that, I mean, I take from the text that it's virtually impossible for us to engage in conversations about feminism or anti-racist politics without centering ourselves in one way or another. And running the reading groups was actually quite um, a controversial move. And I did get some criticism for it um, because it, it some people saw it as kind of the wrong response to be having during um, the kind of momentum of the recent um, BLM and anti-racist demonstrations worldwide. Um, but that leads me around to the question, well, what is the right response? Because my view and my intention with running the reading groups was that I see the burden of change around um, untangling our own white supremacy and our own inner, um, you know, internalized racism to lie with white people. That should be work and labor that we are doing amongst ourselves rather than that bleeding into uh, spaces that are, um, you know, diverse or multiracial or, or, you know, among conversations online or in real life um, between white people and people of color. You know, I see us, I see the responsibility as going to a separate space and, and be doing that kind of work without, um, doing it in public and kind of re-traumatizing uh, people of color and getting and, and uh, you know, making positioning the burden um, of education and of change on them. But then it was still not seen as the right response because um, some people thought that it was still an act of um, celebrating ourselves, you know, look what I'm doing, um, centering ourselves and our own whiteness and our own voices at a time when we should be um, bearing witness to and uplifting uh, the voices of, of black people and, and people of color and people who are facing police brutality, which is obviously the kind of, um, was the, the genesis of the BLM movement. So um, that leads me on to my next question. How can we meaningfully and genuinely do intersectionality? So we know how to read it. We know how to perhaps on some level think it, but how do we actually uh, do it? Um, do either of you have an answer to that? I'm sure if you do, it will be a golden ticket um, <laughs> to um, to feminists who are white worldwide, but give it a go. Um, would anyone like to kick us off on that? I found it really interesting that you've got criticism for running a podcast and um, the reading group sorry just because I'm not necessarily sure there's a way that you could have publicly tried to get people to reflect on their own ideology and it not come across as centering but I think centering is such an interesting thing because there are definitely people that do it um I mentioned in the reading group that when it came to Blackout Tuesday, I had friends on Instagram who were posting black squares and then were posting pictures of dogs straight after it instead of having an entire day for reflection and education. Um, and it'd be interesting to see the people that were criticizing you, what they've been doing and if they had any answers of what you should have been doing instead. Um, but in terms of actually engaging with intersectionality on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm not sure there is one correct way to do it. Um, I think it's got to be a constant reflection and a constant awareness of your behavior, your language, and the way that you do move forward. So kind of for me, 
um, it's going to be, you know, to continue to educate myself because I don't necessarily know enough at this point to to be like writing anything or creating resources. So it's my time now to digest them and to make them accessible to other people by like sharing the resources and saying, can you read this and, you know, share this around. And then also, um, it, like it was kind of, uh, for Blackout Tuesday, I took the day out and read um, journal articles and research surrounding rape and racism and how they intertwine when it comes to victim blaming, sentencing, um, victim credibility. Because um, I volunteer with a consent charity. And as part of that, we do like social media campaigns. And I thought that they were inclusive the the myths that we were busting, the things that we were correcting and the graphics that we were putting out were inclusive. And then after I spent a day educating myself on how racism, you know, largely makes um, going through an assault so much harder, it's to make sure I don't forget about that, that I didn't just spend a day educating myself and that I'm going to now incorporate that information in any activism I do for the consent charity um, because otherwise it is just, um, it's like performative allyship that I spent a day educating like, wow, look at me, rather than putting it in place afterwards. But I don't know if that necessarily actually answers the question of what we can do to achieve intersectionality in our day-to-day -day lives. But... Um, well, I think you've highlighted that intersectionality is a process. Yeah. Um, uh, our words, our acts. Um, I also would bring into that our purchases. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, in academia, who do we cite, for example? Or in your case, Faye, whose books um, do you pick up? So I think that that is... Uh, still an answer of substance. Intersectionality is is a process. Yeah, in, in regards to the criticism, I found it a really um, uh, interesting um, process as well, because part of it makes me think um, how much of that criticism is just part of the world we live in, you know, regardless of, um, you know, applying an intersectional or feminist framework to that criticism or an anti-racist one. Um, I also do think that um, part of the performative activism that we're seeing at the moment um, leads to this almost like um, oppression Olympics or um, activism performativity Olympics, you know, who's doing the most? Oh, you're doing more than me, so I should criticise you. Um, and also just with social media, um, opinions are just omnipresent. And if you put any event out into, you know, the world of the internet, which I did with the reading groups, you are going to get... Um, you know, a, a diversity of opinions come back to you. That's just something that you need to expect when you put something out to the world. But I def I do think that there were, um, you know, elements of that that were, were gendered and that also related to performative activism. But I tried to respond to that criticism with introspection and think, okay, how much of uh, me rea then reacting negatively to that criticism emotionally is um, intertwined with white guilt or um, feeling some sort of injury to my own whiteness and my efforts to perhaps perform um, allyship. Um, and I also have to admit that it's it's a privilege to be able to run a series of reading groups, um, you know, to have the intellectual tools and capacity, the education, um, the articulation, um, the, the time um, to be able to, and the, and the resources and, and the voice and platform to be able to um, recruit people to take part in um, those sorts of events. Um, I, and just to pick up on something you said there, Faye, I mm. also find it extremely interesting, the intersections of sexual violence and, and racism. One part of Me Not You that I found um, really difficult to swallow was how Phipps talks about how white women have weaponized um, rape and sexual assault allegations um, against uh, black men and men of color um, and how um, she she claims that these uh, were false reports. Many of the, you know, throughout history, there have been false reports from, from white women um, to, to damage um, and, and imprison uh, 
black men and men of color. Um, and that's really, really hard to digest as um, a feminist who works in the kind of GBV and sexual violence area, because we're taught this mantra of believe survivors, uh, you know, and that obviously means believing the accounts of um, white women against, um, you know, towards uh, black men or men of color. So I found that, and also it's, it's really interesting, the discussion around how um, racism and sexual violence, sexual violence intersects in the way that if you experience sexual violence or any form of mm. violence as a black woman or woman of colour, that is layered with not just sexism, but also racism in the ways that uh, black women are seen as unrapeable. Phipps talks yeah. about that in the book and how um, black women are and women of colour face kind of layers of exoticization and additional um, objectification that white women don't experience as a result of being white. So, so many fascinating points there. So Faye. something that I like found so horrifying when I was doing my research for Blackout Tuesday was a study on um, college students um, and I think they meant like university level and it was a study um, focused like the participants were white women and it was to try and see if there was any racial bias when it came to um, intervening in a potential sexual assault so they put forward a short story and changed the names to ones that were stereotypically very white and ones that were stereotypically could be associated to a person of colour. And it found that the white women um, would be less likely to intervene if the potential victim of assault was a person of colour and that they'd be more likely to think that the person of colour was going to enjoy what was about to happen and it kind of just really hit home reading that that feminism needs to do better and that feminism really needs to take a look at itself and say like what is our bias because we rally around the word sisterhood and all of that but then when it comes down to it we've still got a bias and we're more likely to help out a white sister than we would a person of like a woman of Colour sister. Thanks so much, Faye. Um, Amy, are you ready to answer this question? So how did you find engaging in the reading groups in terms of intersectionality? What does intersectionality actually mean to you? How can we do it? How, we can, how can we behave and act intersectionally? Um, for me, I, I, I think it comes with the, um, the territory of what I do for a living as an, as an academic and as a researcher and as someone coming from a mixed background. So I teach every day <laughs> and my students and, and it's a conversation of topic in most spaces that I have. I talk about my research. I talk about race and ethnicity and gender and class all the time because I lecture on it. So it's a, it's, it's a part of the everyday vernacular and everyday interactions that I have by virtue of my, of my occupation and by virtue of my position. Um, so what I always, what I, what, I, what I would tell people is what I tell students in the class is that we're going to be exposed to uh, works written by non, non-white and non, non-men. And we're going to see what, what they have to say about those experiences and what it means to come from the, the, the kind of the nether regions of society and, and, and navigate their way through a world that tells them that they're un, unwanted and undesired in very silenced ways and in pervasively silent ways. Um, and it's, it's always a remarkably uncomfortable position. And that's something that, uh, that we explore in, in, my, in my classes and something I explore in my conversations with people. And either they're willing to engage with it or not. And that's something I've learned as an educator is that either you're going to be in the room and you're going to have these conversations or, or, or you're going to have the conversations as we sit down and talk about them or you're, you're not going to be willing to engage with them. And that's, and that's something that we as, as, as people that, don't come, that, that can't dominate white spaces, um, that we have to then navigate with you as well because we're forced to contend with that all the time. So I would always tell people, is educate yourself on things that, that don't, don't center themselves around you, which is usually what, where the most popular pieces of literature and the most popular arguments are coming from. And that's, and that's in there that you have um, you know, a bird's eye view of, of, another, of another perspective that's quite pro, um, 
that's quite uh, significant to to other groups of people outside of you and whiteness. Um, and to me, that's that's a given if you want to attempt to practice something. To me, when I hear intersectionality, I, I hear basically non-white. Uh, and it's not that white people aren't in um, are in that conversation. And it's not that they're only positioned in the conversation if they are as as just dominators and, and an oppressor, because they there are there are poor whites that obviously experience poverty. But uh, to me, when I hear intersectionality, I really hear li this notion of let's look at other experiences in the world that don't center around you and don't center around status quo. And that, I think, is the challenge because we're all even even in my country, we're socialized with this notion of whiteness and class and um, remarkable classism and, and Christianity and in and, and heterosexuality. And it's always really quite robust. And that's the only thing we learn. And we're highly aware that anything of color anything of minority status is usually an elective course if we're teaching it, which tells us exactly why our focuses are what they are. So um, I always tell my students and anyone else, and, and this is something we've, we've, I've been having conversations with colleagues in, in, in my country and outside the country about how to navigate Black Lives Matter and how to respond and how to be an ally is simply listen to what they're saying and, and participate in the ways that, um, that, that, you, that you can be directed and by listening to people of color and listening to women of color and listening to to to, these, to the people that come from these spaces because they're not lying. They have no reason to lie, particularly when they're spread across time and space. I mean, people have kept the same narratives in, in those areas, which tells us that there's something fundamentally true about their arguments. Um, and that's the work that you have to do if you're going to attempt to practice these things. So when I hear intersectionality, I hear practicing and challenging the very thing, the very doctrine and the very thing you've been indoctrinated by as normal. And because that's not normal for the rest of us is things that we're forced to contend with and contend and, and forced to always have to engage and accept. And and that's our normality is our, is our uncomfortableness. The fact that we have to navigate our uncomfortableness, not, we're never not allowed to be uncomfortable. So I, if you're uncomfortable, I think that's a good start and reading, you know, and, and engaging with people that are, that are, that want to be informed and, and are challenging themselves. And that's, that's always a good place to begin. And you're going to get, get it wrong. Like anyone else challenging themselves for the, for the first time I hear it in my class when we talk about race and ethnicity or women of color, um, students always get it wrong. And, and, um, and that's fine. But the goal is to challenge that and to, and to listen and to participate and, and to not brush aside the data that's uncomfortable, to not brush aside the stories that are uncomfortable because those things are so vulnerable in, in and of themselves. And for them to come to the surface says there's something really robust about them. So it's, I think it's really about um, listening. I, I think we've heard this quite often since Black Lives has, has blown up and, and it's, it's gotten the ear of white people. Listening, participating in that way and picking up pieces of literature and art and, and celebrating something that, unfor that usually is not you at, at the center. And I think that's a good place to start. Thanks so much, Amy. There were kind of two operative words, I feel, in what you just said. Number one, work. And I wonder that wh whether that's why we shy away from these forms of intersectional refle inner reflection, because it's a form of work and labor and work is hard, right? And we live in a modern capitalist society where we're constantly running on the treadmill. And this work is, is really, really hard. And also you said, number two, listen. So um, that really resonates with me. To me, doing intersectionality is knowing when to work and when to listen, when to sit down um, and shut up. And I don't know, maybe I'm I'm not succeeding in that because I'm here recording this podcast, hearing my own voice. You know, I've done the series of reading groups. Am I listening enough um, is a question that I find myself constantly um, asking. Um, if you don't mind, Amy, um, I'd like to um, draw out a bit further leading on uh, from what Faye said about uh, what Faye brought up around kind of sexual and gender-based violence and racism. Um, again, maybe this is a contradiction because I'm asking a mixed race woman to explain and educate on this issue. So tell me also what you think of the politics of, of that sort of testimonial and conversational aspect. Um, but do you have anything to say around um, sexual violence um, and violence against women? 
because I don't think that's spoken enough about in terms of intersectional frameworks, because sometimes we do it in this really kind of boxed way where if you're a woman of color, you're this kind of like homogenized group, or if you're black or Hispanic, you'll experience uh, X, Y, and Z when it comes to violence against women. But we don't talk enough about women who are bi or mixed race, um, biracial or mixed race. Yeah, um, the, f- the first part, I un- to, to what you're uh, to, to even to asking and, 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 the, and, and the politics of asking the question in general. I feel two ways about it. Um, one, I do feel you know people should do the work, and it shouldn't be asked uh, of people of color to do the work for not for people for for, for people um, for white people. Um, but then there's the educator in me that understands that this is a conversation that needs to be had, and as uncomfortable and I and and, and being in the classroom having very uncomfortable conversations, whether it be with men or people or, or, or white people. That that's part of my job is to sit there and help navigate that. So I look at it from that perspective as well, regardless of of, of kind of the juxtaposition that I personally may be in, and I'm and, and, and I'm entitled to. So I just to let you know that's kind of the, the where the, the I think the, the fence I'm straddling in my response. But as far as a woman of color, when it comes to uh, sexual violence, um, as a woman who has experienced sexual violence and um, and and I have dated white men, um, I, I find that in my experiences with white, because I'm a straight woman, um, with white men that I get set aside quite often because I'm other and they have they, they, don't, they don't hold back from telling me that I'm other. And I find it quite odd that I, I'm this thing that's that's good enough to be fetishized, but I'm I, I'm also positioned in this place that I'm not good enough for anything else because that's what other white women are for. White women are who you marry. White women are who who you are. Um, that that's who that's the good girl. At the end of the day, that's the woman who will stay with you. I'm trouble because I'll challenge you because I'm already coming from a place where that I ought, that I disagree with my subordination, um, whether that be from a, being a mixed place or, or growing up in a machismo environment. Like I, I've been told that quite often. Oh, you're too fiery. And and these very stereotypical tropes come out of you know these men's mouths, and not all of them, obviously. But I, you know, when it comes to the sexual violence of um, of mixed people, it's it's very much kind of in between this. Like we're desired, at least in my experience, desired because we look like we're something other. We're some we're, we could be somewhat acceptable. We're not quote black, and that's been told to me quite to my to my face as well. Like like you're I, I'm not completely sh- shut off. I'm not I'm not this hidden secret, which to me just screams alarm bells when I've heard that out of men's mouths, and at the same time, I'm not good enough to, to be, to be the thing that's kept. And I, and it, at the same time, I'm just in this juxtaposition and it's a very unique position. And I think it's very common for people, for, for women or anyone that's kind of fetishized in this weird in this space, because we're being framed between black and white. And it's a, it's a position that's not often discussed. And, and, and it's, and it's something that should highlight what black people and women of color have to contend with as they're fetishized themselves. But what's often missing from that conversation is kind of the glorification of white women in that language and how we, all of us as women of color are trying in some way to aspire to that, whether it's whitening our skin, bleaching our skin, whether it's creating um, and going to getting plastic surgery, Surgery, to have Eurocentric features, and that we're always positioned against this idea. And yet, yes, we do have you know ex- you know examples that are kind of um, different from from that norm, but 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 which are highly fetishized, like Kim Kardashian and stuff. So when I think of gender violence, not only do I think of the overtness of it, of how women of color, women are fundamentally usually on, on not believed because they're women, but you're less believed because you're a woman of color because you're even more fetishized because you're even more sexualized and who would want you anyways. And there's very much this language attached to it because, you know, it's, it's white women that men want. And that never, you, that's never negated in the conversation, whether it's explicit or implicit, you, you're highly aware that's, that's quote, who you're more or less supposed to be and who you're theoretically supposed to quote, quote, compete with. And it's something that never goes away. And um, it's, it's, it's something that contributes to the violence that we experience as women and what femininity looks like. It's whiteness, of course, um, and how we're supposed to perform it, politeness, um, very Christian approaches. And some of us don't come from those places. I'm a Jewish woman. I mean, I don't, I fundamentally don't agree with this idea of subordination and silencing myself and being polite all the time. And that could have to do a lot to do with my culture. So when I think of gender violence, that's what I think of. I think of the systematic violence of, of, of colorism and of whiteness and what's idealized as a, as a woman and, um, and, and having not only men express that to me explicitly, but women support that um, implicitly as well. And I'm the odd thing in the room. And it, it, no, one just, no one discourages that truth from, from being the reality that women like me and women of color experience at a, at a deeper and more significant level. So coming back to this intersectional perspective, I think because I'm struggling, that fence between both sides, I'm highly aware 
of the of of of, of what women of color uh, uh, and more and more obvious are experiencing than me. If, uh, this is where I am, and that makes me more heightened, aware of what they have to say, and um and the languages we use to silence ourselves because we're we're highly aware if we if we come forward with anything that will be dismissed or it, in in a very aggressive way. There's something about being a woman of color that people feel like they have the right to be aggressive to you. If you're white, it, there's some there's the, the aggressiveness is much more subtle, but people will explicitly tell you you're a whore or you're a slut or whatever the case is. And I've had those experiences myself in normal everyday interactions because I've told someone no. And because I'm not seen as white, how dare I say that to quote a white man? So to me, it's, it's a mixture of things. It contributes to why we don't come forward. It contributes to why we don't trust white women. It contributes to um, kind of what I study in my own studies, intragender sexism, this weird competition thing in which we're always trying to uphold an image that we fundamentally can't be. We can't change our skin color. We, it's really hard to change our facial features it's, and to be complicit. And it's white women that support those these kind of trope ideologies of femininity that we are always hoping that white women challenge within their own groups because we, and particularly as a feminist researcher and someone who studies femininity, I'm always hoping that those women challenge those tropes because I know fundamentally the data shows it doesn't support you. And yet they're the biggest advocates of it. And I'm always sitting there like, you guys, come on, come on. This isn't benefiting you. Getting married isn't going to complete you. Having a child doesn't make you a better person. You know, doing what your man, making sure you have a man doesn't, doesn't make you fundamentally better off. And yet you, you maintain these ideologies at your own subordination and if you're doing it at your level guess what we have to do it we have to ex ex exist within that reality at, at an, in an aggressive way and it's something you're not saying simply because you, you quote had it better than us and um so that's how i ex experience it and it's not me trying to demonize white women or any way i think it has a lot to do with their socialization and uh, not only as gender but of the racial social socialization as well it's kind of this weird um, concept that I think Patricia Hill Collins calls the gilded the gilded cage. She says all women are in a gilded cage. Just white women happen. Ha uh, excuse me, all women are in a uh, are in a cage, but white women happen to be in a gilded cage, and they convince themselves that they're superior simply because of of um, betterness of white because they're associating themselves with whiteness and the, and the things and the privileges that come with whiteness. So being on that fence, I, that's what I see, and it just makes me more heightened aware of kind of the things I have and the things I don't, and and the things that I, that I don't have to deal. With, which are worse than the, the positions I have. And it just makes me more and more highly aware. And I, I wish white women did the work to challenge those, those, in, in, you know, those patriarchal tropes that they consider to be feminine and and with it you'll end up challenging the, what it, what it mean, what it means to be a white a white woman as well and there i think is the work that ahead of white women is is, is kind of unpacking their, their privileges of their femininity as it's because their femininity is linked to their to, to their whiteness Thank you so much, Amy. I'm going to go away and think about um, everything you've just said. I think you articulated really well how whiteness is um, associated with like true womanhood, how white women are at the top of the kind of pyramid of womanhood. Um, if there's almost like a there's almost like a hierarchy, isn't there, of um, genuine womanhood, and women yeah, exactly, and white women exactly. sit at the top of that. <coughs> Excuse yeah, exactly. me. And I like how you brought up um, microaggressions and everyday racism and sexism and how it's interwoven in everyday interactions because we often see sexual violence or acts of serious uh, sexism or racism as, you know, something that's kind of going on in the shadows. It's very rare. It's perpetrated by strangers. But actually it's, you know, it's sewn into the fabric of um, of, our, of our everyday lives. Um I think you you highlighted really well as well how because women white women sit at the top of this pyramid of hierarchy of womanhood uh, they're seen as like the truest form of being a woman that is reflected in the institutional protections that they get so I think Faye earlier you also mentioned um the police so if we think about the um Amy Cooper incident recently and there are many other cases and examples to bring up the reliance on and the trust in the police and in and, and, and in the authorities that we have as white women. Um, and that, that trust is still uh, pretty low, pretty poor. Uh, what did you both think of that before we move on to our final couple of questions? Because I think it was, um, I think it was really interesting. Um, it definitely overlapped with this kind of cancel culture approach that we seem to be taking towards 
um, when people fuck up. So, you know, they should lose their job. They should be, they should be fired. They should be ostracized. And I'm just interested in, you know, where is the space for learning? But then there's almost no point saying that because learning processes take um, years or lifetimes. And in the case of the African-American man that was on the uh, the bird watcher in Central Park in, in, in relation to the Amy Cooper case, it could have been a question of seconds for him whether he, um, you know, came out of that situation with his life or not. So I'd be interested to hear what you both think before we move on to our last couple of questions. I think it's disgusting behaviour. Um, I don't think there's there's any way you can frame her behaviour in any sort of positive light or that it should be. Um, it's just such kind of putting herself in this framework of a vulnerable woman of somebody who is going to be attacked and is threatened by the mere presence of somebody and then weaponizing that and I don't see how there's any way she didn't know what she was doing um in the um I've seen other stuff like it a, um, a TikTok for example that somebody posted and it was a a man of colour and he was stood like a reasonable distance away from this woman and she was literally stood there screaming don't hurt me stop threatening me and he's like so I think with Amy Cooper and anything that is in similar vein it's white women framing themselves in this portrait of vulnerable and I'm going to be attacked and weak and it kind of makes me wonder about what lives they're living outside of this presentation of themselves in these situations where they weaponize their femininity and their whiteness and like cast um, this danger onto innocent people um, because it is just this ideology of being weak and uncertain but I don't see how in any way they would not know what they were doing and that they were weaponizing themselves and uh, what has like caused them to get to this point that that's their behavior. So another thing that I saw was a TikTok of a woman hysterically screaming, don't hurt me, stop threatening me. And the person, the black man um, was stood like so far away from her, like he wouldn't have been able to kick her let alone physically assault her like with his hands or anything and she was so hysterical and it was really quite traumatizing to watch because it's just like that's the danger that men are facing when you know their skin color isn't white and that it's so ridiculous and what are we doing as you know feminists who are white to um to degrade that kind of behavior and to make it so that you know it's like well we're not supporting you in this yeah I think it's so interesting uh to consider cases and incidences like Amy Cooper within an intersectional framework because I think it's more complicated than um than people like to concede I think that um she was clearly weaponizing her white privilege and the relationship that she has with the police. Um, and also I think that, however, I think that we're kind of failing to, uh, I think there's a bit of a disconnect between um, narratives around racism and narratives around sexism. We're not succeeding in mapping them over to each other in ways where we can un understand these incidences properly. So we're, we're brought up um, as white women in a world, you know, we're constantly bombarded with this messaging around, um, around black men that they, and, and men of color, that they are um, a threat to our, our, our womanhood and our, and our safety. And um, we're brought up to think that, um, especially in the US, that, that they are, are rapists, but also women don't have gender privilege. Men have uh, gender privilege, and um, that includes black men and, and men of color. They have gender privilege, but they don't have racial privilege. And I think we've really, really, I, I think we've done a bad job 
at understanding how both groups are oppressed, but are oppressed in different ways. I hope that makes sense. To me, intersectionality, going back to maybe an earlier question, is being able to... Um, to articulate your privilege in these more kind of complex and nuanced ways. So people often push away um, the label of privileged if they're a woman or if um, they are a very poor working or working class person. So you hear all the time, um, there are a few like documentaries and books and so on about like the forgotten men, um, you know, mostly working class white men who would never term, them, term themselves as, as privileged because they, they live in poverty. But they do have gender privilege and they also do often have racial privilege. And so I think that we, we struggle with this with this term and being able to apply it to these really difficult and painful cases like the, the Amy Cooper incident. I think I think it's really easy for us to be like, um, uh, so yes, that that was a racist incident, which I absolutely agree with. But then I think there's a more complex analysis to have there in terms of the relationships between uh, black men and men of color and white women, um, because they both have... Uh, they both have characteristics and experiences that fall outside of um, white patriarchy. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm very much aligned with both kind of what both what what you're thinking, what, what you guys are thinking. She's highly, she was highly aware of what she was doing. You could tell she what she was doing as a you know as a woman who has been sexually assaulted. I was. Uh, you know, and, and as a, a woman, a biracial woman, I was more than offended, and it's something I've seen um, again and again and again, and even within my own family, this idea, this this kind of vitriol and dramatic response to something that's not fundamentally happening, and get and doing things because you can get away with it, and you're using your privilege, um, even at the intersection of of, of having of being underprivileged with your gender. I mean, we know there's no such thing as as, as absolute privilege and absolute subordination. What there is 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 a matrix of of those two, and you're straddling the line of something. Um, just it depends on the circumstance in which comes which which, which position comes forward um, for for whatever reason. So I, she was highly aware of what she's doing. That's what I thought. As far as council culture and what you were saying about you know learning and and, and you know and, and evolving and coming from this, and obviously this is a moment. In my experience, and, and this is horrible to say, but I genuinely, and in my experience, this is true for most people. People that want to learn will do the hard work, kind of what, what we see what's happening in these focus groups. will seek out this information. They'll, and they'll, they'll usually be confronted by a moment of uncomfortability when something's not working for them. And they're realizing they're fundamentally, quote, wrong in the situation um, based on the context of what's happening. And they'll do that work in and out. And I see that in my classrooms. And I see that with my colleagues. And I see that with people that, have, that when they find out what I do for a living, have these conversations with them. Um, but as far as cancel culture in this moment, a part of me fundamentally believes, yeah, okay, good. Because to me, it's this, it's a tip of the iceberg. It's one moment you got caught doing something you normally do, because this is a pattern of behavior that you've developed. And for whatever reason, whether it's right or wrong, you've developed this, you've maintained this. Obviously, this has worked for you in various instances, because this is a, this is your creature of habit, as most people are. So when I see this, I see a history of, of experiences in which you've utilized this for whatever reasons and you got canceled because of it. And in my experiences, what I know about most people, people only learn when there's severe consequences, especially if they're economic. People change their tune really fast. So we see that with Black Lives Matter. The reason why people are changing their tune is because there's economic consequences to what's happening. We see that with the defunding the police, that's strictly economic. And I and so when I think of cancel culture, I think if it's funneled in that direction, this idea that why don't we do something to create policy? This is a moment that's that's, that's mounting into other moments. We see it as a as a series of of events that really are, are fundamentally speaking volumes about the experiences of these people and the contentions they have to live with on a regular basis. And moving that into policy, then I'm all for it. It's when it's these one off things and and people pop off and there's nothing really done about it. Like it's easy to cancel one person. It's not easy to cancel to to cancel an entire thought process and entire ideology and if it's moving in that direction as an educator i'm all about that but for these one-offs it what it does is scares white people as it should uh, because welcome to the reality of non-white people this is what we deal with all the time and you have an uncomfortable moment because you were racist and it was obvious you were racist in other areas so you you're not going to get a lot of empathy from people of color who have experienced this from uh, from every white person they've, they've encountered with whether or not it's explicit or implicit so my response to it's good 
good. She should have absolutely had it. This will teach other people not to do this. And if you're not going to change your behavior, it will definitely make an impression on anyone else watching though, which is the goal is, is, is the ramification of the consequences that come from that ripple effect. And that will go in both directions, positive and negative, but it will definitely make sure people aren't as explicit in these ways. And we can then document that and go forward with what happens when you do violate these interactions and you can't do these one-off trope, you know, oh, like here's my box on, on my on my square, my black square, and I'm all for solid Solidarity. No, it's not about that. A lot of that's done out of fear, and we know that. And we want we want significant change. If that comes in, 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 the, in the space of fearing that you're going to lose your job because you're racist, you should. You should racist people shouldn't be on the job. You're going to deal with people of color. That's the last person should, that, should, that should be on the job dealing with people. So that's how I felt about it. Hmm. So interesting. I guess what I'm trying to get at is um, I think that um, – sometimes cancel culture deflects from a more complex conversation about um, intersectionality. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that sometimes if we just um, bundle something up and say, okay, that's racist, um, uh, move it out of the way. I I don't think it um, encourages us or facilitates us to have these, you know, we've been talking throughout this podcast and during the reading groups about having these deep painful um processes of self-reflection and i think i'm worried about cancel culture being um this process of just combing out bad up- apples from the police or you know oh amy cooper and then amy cooper's now gone she's lost her job but structural racism is still there i think it's kind of smoke and mirrors and i feel the same way about the tearing down of the statues i think that amy cooper should um uh, receive ramifications for her actions and should engage in, um, you know, now uncomfortable processes of reflection about um, ar- around her own whiteness. I also think uh, I am personally a supporter of uh, colonial and slave trade statues being uh, torn down, tear them all down. Um, that's my opinion. But I I wonder whether it's keeping us at this very shallow level of self-reflection. It's like, oh, well, I supported the tearing down of that statue. I was maybe even, you know, maybe some listeners were actually at some of those demos um, across the UK, uh, you know, defacing or tearing down statues. Um, But how much of that is outwards activism rather than inwards? I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I also think that intersectionality is sometimes framed and conceived of in these really flat ways so if you're a woman you're oppressed for example or if you're a person of color you're oppressed but actually I think oppression is very very complex and I think we use our power in ways um, that cling on to the parts of privilege that we possess in order to try and override the aspects of our uh, identity or experience that are um that are subordinated. So for example, as a white woman, you don't have gender privilege, but you do have racial privilege. So you will utilize and weaponize that whiteness um, to compensate um, somehow for the loss of gender privilege. Um, I I watched a really fascinating talk uh, when there was a conference on intersectionality at the University of Edinburgh. And um, there was a black feminist who talked about misogyny among uh, black men. And she said how misogyny is weaponized because um, because they don't possess racial privilege, but what they do possess is gender privilege. And I know this is getting into really, really sticky territory, but what I'm trying to get at is I think that intersectionality is like a web. I, and I, often we address it in, in these these quite like flat ways. And I think that it's easy to fixate on these single incidences that have gone viral. But I think all of us in our everyday lives, we utilize the parts of privilege that we do possess in order to compensate or override the parts that we don't possess. Um, And that can even, as Faye was saying, um, mean that you, you replicate some of the, um, some of the assumptions or um, sexist ideas or racist ideas that people have towards you. So, for example, women as weak and vulnerable and, uh, you know, these fair maidens that need rescuing, um, we can sometimes weaponize that when it comes to our interactions with institutional um, power and the police in order to gain protection. And I find that really, really interesting how we're sometimes willing to kind of trade a bit. So, you know, in order to be uh, protected in this situation and have my uh, my privilege protected, I need to trade in some of my chips and I need to uh, let them have their sexist assumptions about me in order to be protected. I, I just find that really fascinating behaviorally. 
we'd kind of all be lying, I guess, if we said that we haven't at some point tried to take advantage of certain aspects of our life. So it's like, even on a simple level, like if you go in, I've been into like shops and haven't been buying very much, but I've only had my card on me. And I've said, oh, you know, like, can I um, pay for this with my card? And the male shopkeeper said, well, it depends what kind of mood I'm in. And then it's like instantly you become this like bubbly, presentable female and you start smiling or like I did at any point. And I kind of walked out afterwards and I was like, oh, that was a very feminist of me. But like I had done it in terms of um, like when the police have been involved. So I was at house party once and there was a large fight um, and my friend had protected me from like a guy that had hit me across the face um, and he was very drunk. And when the police came to interview him, he was like muddling his words and he was kind of being misconstrued that he'd instigated it. And then I was like, oh God, oh God, what's going to happen? So just really amped up the emotions and started crying and being like, he was just looking after me and he was just protecting me and really like kind of horribly presented myself as this weak person that had been protected by my male friend and that I didn't want him to get in trouble for it. But I was only able to do that because of my racial, like, oh, sorry, the word has gone from my head. Like racial privilege? Thank you, privilege. <laughs> Um, because of my racial privilege and that somebody in like a kind of different neighborhood or a different social circle if my friend you know had been a person of color if I'd been a person of color I wouldn't have been able to utilize that and it's kind of he probably wouldn't have got in trouble because he genuinely hadn't done anything wrong but it's like it's challenging our own behavior I guess and trying to stop utilizing our own racial privilege yeah thank you so much for um kind of really leaning into that um that discussion Faye and admitting um that story I think that um you know we can sometimes get judged for revealing mm -hmm. um these mistakes and these vulnerabilities um in relation to these difficult conversations but I'm sure if all listeners looked inwards and cast their mind back, they would be able to find maybe if there's white women who are, you know, among the listeners, times when they've interacted with authorities or the police or managers or older people and utilised um, kind of um, sexist tropes um, about femininity and, and womanhood in order to uh, strategically uh, navigate a situation or get the best possible outcome. Really, really interesting. Um, so I'm just aware of the time. I'm going to move on to the uh, final couple of questions so that you can go off and enjoy your evening soon or Amy, your, your day in the States. Mm -hmm. um, so my next question is around uh, white fragility. Um, this kind of constituted the majority of conversation within the looking in the mirror reading groups. So Alison Phipps, the author of Me Not You, talks about uh, the fragility of whiteness and what she means by this concept or term is that uh, whiteness has certain characteristics to it. It's performative, um, it's uh, colorblind in inverted commas, uh, it's defensive, alert to threats, uh, obsessed with power, um, predatory, uh, competitive, uh, and it's obsessed with being centered. So it's very kind of uh, egotistical. And she also talks about how it's balancing on this really fine thread. So it doesn't take a lot to upset it. And that, that goes back around to its alertness to threat. It's very, very, it has eyes on all sides of its head looking out for predators or predatory forces that might sap away, sap um, or, or, you know, or leech on its power. And I think she used the example of the Brexit vote, how, um, how, um, how that became a discussion about immigration and about race and about uh, racial relations and politics in, in the UK and how uh, people voting for Brexit was, um, was, I don't know whether she said it quite this simply, but this was part of her analysis, that it was about uh, white people kind of clawing back uh, their power, um, their hegemonic power within um, the UK and wanting to maintain a status quo in which they um, 
in which they benefit on. I don't think we talk enough as well about how uh, Brexit was not just an immigration debate, but it was also one of empire and our legacy and history of empire. It had very much this narrative of kind of, I mean, it was a literal part, uh, slogan, uh, you know, taking back control, which, um, you know, uh, kind of mirrors the um, make America great again narratives. So this idea that the time of empire was this kind of golden era and that um, immigration and the sharing out and distributing of resources um, and more multicultural societies are, is causing like a degradation of that golden era. And we want to reinsert that era. And that means a reinsertion of kind of white power and white supremacy, but that it, it doesn't take a lot. She talks about how it doesn't take a lot for, for white people to get defensive and, and the reactions that we will have if we are prodded in the wrong way are extremely violent um, and powerful and um, they kind of outweigh whatever the act was. So it's, it's just a prod or a prick. And then we there's there's this kind of white rapture in response. Um, so I'd like to ask the pair of you, uh, where do you find this kind of white fragility um, in yourselves? Uh, so where do you find this alertness to threat, this defensiveness, this competitiveness, uh, this obsession with being centred? Um, does any of what I've just said resonate with you at all? One of the things that's kind of stuck with me throughout the whole BLM movement is it's not enough to be not racist because I would kind of thought for a very long time that I'm not racist so I'm okay and it's about we need to be going further than that and I suppose before the past like however long if somebody had told me that I wasn't doing enough I'd have probably been been defensive of it and I'd have probably said well no like I'm not racist and it's you know in par with the culture that you can't recognize your own mistakes and you can't evolve and how toxic that is because it's one of the things that has been coming up more and more as of late is you know highlight when you're wrong highlight when you've done something wrong and accept that apologize for it and then do better um, and that there isn't enough of that going on and that white, fra white fragility is based on that. It's, you know, not accepting that you can do better and that you should be doing better, but that by doing that, you have to accept that you haven't been doing better, that you haven't been doing enough. And that's when people are going to get defensive. And I think... It's with the whole Brexit thing. I had conversations with people shortly after Brexit that said that it wasn't a racist motivated campaign. And it was like, statistically speaking, hate crimes went up by X percent in the following days after it. And that was just the ones that were reported. And then trying to talk somebody through that, like um, some of my family members, and they just weren't getting it. And it's like, I don't see how where you're coming from has any grounding and how you can turn around and say that the statistics, the facts of what is happening right now in our country that we're taking control back of isn't racist. And it's a massive kind of like placebo that we think we're taking back control when largely like the you know, the Brexit deal has been going on for how long now and how much control over it do we actually have? And then how much upset has it caused in our government that nobody here has voted for because we've not had control over it and things like that. And it's just, yeah, people not accepting that they need to do better and that they've done wrong. So like with the story that I just shared, the fact that some people wouldn't share a story like that, of you know, openly saying, yeah, I I utilised my racial privilege and that was wrong and other people won't be able to do that and I should be fighting for people who can't do that so that in a situation that could be far more deadly for them, they don't need to do that. And, you know, that they wouldn't then evolve themselves because they're scared that they're going to be called out for it um, when we should just stop being so fragile and... Like, so um, a um, 
influencer that I follow, um, some of the, she spent a long time um, during the BLM promoting it and is still sharing resources. And one of the things that she said was, I'm expecting to be criticized and I'm expecting that I'm not going to get all of this right. But what's important is when I do get criticized, I learn from it and that I shouldn't not be doing it just because I'm scared. Yeah, I, th- I think in order to engage in these conversations, we need to be fragile, right? And we need to be patient with ourselves and each other around mistakes. Um, I mean, even the idea of white fragility makes me feel on an emotional level fragile. And I found myself in many, many, um, you know, uh, intersectional feminist spaces where um, when people go on rants about uh, white women or about the police, I mean, I found myself getting um, defensive because um, obviously that these are systems in which I benefit from and I'm scared of losing those benefits. Um, I am scared of losing those benefits. We're, we're scared that in a more equal society um, yes. that um, the benefits will be um, mm. diluted. Um, and that is, I think, at the centre of, you know, I think that's what's at the beating heart of a lot of white fragility, particularly among the working classes. Um, they think, well, you know, what have I got to lose, really? What privilege have I got to to lose? And I want to protect the the few resources that I do have and those resources they have as a result of being being white. Um, so, Amy, do you have anything to say about white fragility? How does that term make you feel? Where do you see white fragility in yourself? Well, it's it, it, to be frank, I think because I grew up so heightenedly aware of white and brown experiences and plainly seeing the privileges the, the white members of my family got that I that I wasn't afforded and hearing the logic that came from that, I, I mean... I, I, in, 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 in the instances in which I may have, I, I know I've experienced white privileges in the spaces that I pass as white. And yet um, I'm heightenedly aware of the language white people use and, and, and the logics they use to, and which more or less encompasses white fragility and, um, and, and focusing and white women in particular focusing on other forms of subordination, gender in particular, gender or sexual orientation. Um, so because of it, I, I, I find myself in an, in an interesting space that I'm allowed to be in these places because I pass, but I don't share the same sentiments. And, um, and I find myself silenced or being incapable of responding or getting a, a, a fair responses or objective responses to any critiques of those arguments that, that, that are kind of maintained in those circles. So what I find, I, I always find myself like, I feel like on the outside looking in in those spaces. I look like one. I, I can I can pass as one, but I'm not one of the group. Um, but in the instances, I think, in which I have been afforded white privilege have been um, by people of color that don't know that I'm passing, um, obviously. And I, and I can I completely see why white people feel the way they do about not wanting to sacrifice these things because, you know, I, the first time I was considered white was in Europe, not in my country because I'm, I'm Latino. So obviously I'm not, I'm not white and go moving around in those spaces and people being convinced I was white, treating me as white. I had never experienced that type of kind of carte blanche access to certain things, even as a woman. And I, and, and that, I think those types of the kind of juxtaposition, those experiences of being juxtapositioned within each other have kind of been for me of um, why people maintain it and 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 wh- how they can keep themselves blind to it, largely because they're not required to challenge it, to be, to be challenged by it, and they're not really required to see it and experience or witness the experiences of others um, without without more or less justifying their own position. Um, I, I think it's largely because I grew up in places where those things hadn't quite formulated yet. So I, as far as seeing it within myself, um, when it comes to women who are darker hued than me, I find myself speaking up or amplifying their voices in, in, in uh, academic circles or referring back to their research because I know they'll have a, they have a valid argument. And uh, on, on, on largely enough, I know I'm going to be listened to largely because I look white in certain white spaces and I make it a point to do that. But that's simply because I'm so aware and I've, and I've experienced those different realities and, 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 I am, and I'm trained in those positions. But as far as benefiting from from them, I know that I'm going to be listened to than my than than um, than a woman of color who's explicitly a woman of color. I know I'm going to be listened to her in the room, hands down. Um, and I make it a point to to redirect that focus in the event that she said that she's saying something of quality and she has something to participate that's not often being heard. Um, so that's how I use my white privilege. Um, 
as far as any white guilt, um, when I think of that, I think of my white family and and um, and the benefits they've received simply because of their whiteness and by being associated with that, that I get to walk into a law firm and my, my mom is a white woman and I get to have access to to top end lawyers. And that is something my brown family has no access to and couldn't even couldn't even begin to envision what that looks like, what white spaces like that look like and what privileged class spaces look like, like, like that look like. So I have these kind of weird instances where I, I have access simply by virtue of my mother, by virtue of the white, my white family and the, and the wealth privilege that has come with that on that side. I may not have inherited it, but by simply by accessing it, by witnessing it, I get to see what that life looks like. And I get to see who navigates those spaces and the things they just more or less get away with simply because they don't have to question and no one challenges it. So by that, I feel, I think the brown, the brown girl in me feels guilty that that's something that is un- unimaginable from that perspective. And by moving between these spaces, I have a responsibility to acknowledge both of these things and to speak on behalf of the things not being said in the room. And I think that's what my privilege of my education is affording me by pursuing my PhD. Most people from my background don't get PhDs, but I'm able to, I think, finagle that and, and maneuver those spaces with white, with white groups and pass as white to be able to amplify those voices. And that's what I've chosen to do with that. But I, that's, I think, the privilege I get from being in that in that space. And a part of me does feel guilty that I pass as the acceptable version, the most acceptable version of a Latina because I'm a white Latina and, um, and I get to do things and I'm not, you know, I'm not pulled over the side of the road and, you know, cops don't, don't question me in my country simply because I'm a wider version of my race. Um, and I think that when it comes to those things, I'm, I'm heightenedly aware that that's something that my brother, for instance, who's a Brown man could never get. So I find myself in this weird position that I'm, I'm grateful. I, I completely get it. But a part of me is so heightenedly aware that this that I'm still on the outside. I'm never fully in. And I completely see all the work that white people have to do. And it's a lot of work. And I, by virtue of being exposed to a double consciousness, I don't have to start from ground zero. I've always been at ground zero. And that's a work that, that white people have to do. And you're going to be uncomfortable in the process of that. But there's plenty of people, there's plenty of language, there's plenty of research that speaks about these things. And I, it, I think it's the job of white people to work in and engage with that and, and, and figure out how to dismantle your um, these kind of hidden privileges, which are more or less subordinate processes still in and of themselves in order to um, unpack what that means for you as you attempt to navigate that as you move forward. But for me, it's like I, I, I have, I guess, a, a sense of, of white guilt um, in the fact that I get to enter spaces, I know I wouldn't be allowed if I was brown. I know I wouldn't be allowed if I came. If my background is quite apparent that it came from inner city gang environment. I, I already know that, and I've seen that in my focus groups, for instance. People react completely different to me once they realize that I didn't come from the middle class, that I'm passing as white, and their reactions change dramatically. And I know I wouldn't have access to those spaces because of it. So there's a part of me that understands what comes with that that, that form of colorism, on not only from white people but from people of color, knowing that I'm passing as well. And what what is my responsibility? in those spaces because I'm conscientious of both of both these experiences. Thank you so much, Amy. I think that's such an, I mean, we could run a whole reading group series on the concept of passing. I just find that fascinating and how that relates to denial and voice and privilege. I just find the concept fascinating. And thank you for bringing up class. I think in our intersectional discussions and analysis, we really do forget class. Um, I think that, uh, for example, my working class roots are sometimes a way that can sometimes be a bit of a bed for my white fragility, because I can think to myself that, oh, well, I'm not. Um, and, and I, and I find myself thinking it even now, regardless of, um, the education I've had around feminism and critical race studies and so on. Well, you know, actually you're not as privileged as, as you think I am. And one more comment I have about what you've both said, uh, in relation to the last question. Um, I think that, what is really important in terms of making ourselves um, less defensive as a result of white fragility is separating uh, structures from the self. So, for example, um, I've found when I engage men in conversations about feminism and gender-based violence, they've often said to me, well, feminism has um, makes men feel like being a man is bad and that masculinity gets, you know, it becomes equated with uh, evil and badness. And I don't like this concept of toxic masculinity because it makes us feel bad and it, it creates all of these negative connotations when when we think of masculinity. But I think what the failure is there and and kind of mapping that on to whiteness is that we're not, 
nobody's attacking you as an individual when they say, you know, check your privilege and make sure, you know, you engage in these processes of self-reflection, educate yourself. Nobody's talking about about you saying that you as a white person individually are, are evil. Nobody is trying to equate whiteness with evilness or badness, which is what I think gets people's backs up. It's about dismantling these hegemonic structures that privilege whiteness at the top. Um, so I think that that for me is a really helpful technique in terms of remembering that nobody's talking about, they are talking about me as a vehicle for change. And that's where I'm actually a positive, but nobody's attacking me and saying that I'm a piece of shit. They're saying that the structures in which we all uphold um, are a piece of shit. I hope that makes sense. That's just a comment that I wanted to, to make uh, to wrap up the last question. So my final question uh, before we hop off is, do you think that we can ever be true allies? So uh, Phipps in, in her book, Me Not You, talks about how um, efforts of allyship are acts and routines of self-sanitizing. Self and during the reading group series, I often ended on this really interesting question of, do you think that Phipps's writing is in inherently contradictory? Or do you think these reading groups are inherently contradictory? Because is it is it ever possible because we're swimming in this sea of white supremacy for us to um engage in activism and perform allyship and um you know act allyship without centering ourselves so do you think that it's possible can we truly be allies without this self sanitizing going on in the background because i'm getting increasingly pessimistic um i've definitely felt myself feel i don't know in some ways more obliged to engage in processes of self-reflection about my whiteness and in some ways less obliged since running the reading group series. And I wonder whether I did a bit of self-sanitizing. So do you think that we can truly be allies? Um, so I think my answer to this would have been different had you asked me before I participated in the reading groups to now. That's really interesting. Um, really interesting. Which is one mm -hmm. of the things somebody else said well, when I like participated, somebody said, um, should allyship be the goal? Is that what we're aiming to? And is that in itself not centering? Because then you're not presenting yourself, well, sorry, you're presenting yourself as somebody who is an ally. And in some sense, can you ever reach allyship? Because I'm never going to fully understand the struggles of a person of a color, a person of color, because I'm not one. And that is something I'm never going to have firsthand experience with. And is it performative for me to want to call myself an ally? Is it soothing my white guilt and my white fragility by saying I'm an ally? And should my goal not just to be to educate and to ease the burden? of people of colour and to ease their suffering and the discrimination that they face and therefore what I am, what label I am and you know what domain that comes under is kind of irrelevant and that's something that I'd never considered before joining the reading groups and somebody pointed it out to me um, because you want to be an ally don't you, you want to be a good person, you want to be a good feminist, you want to be a good white person but that's kind of what allyship is dictating, that there are good and bad white people and there's good activists and then there's, you know, lazy activists and then there's performative activists and all of, you know, the spectrum of where people fall in what work they're doing. But that is still a way that we're centering ourselves as white people by, you know, branding on this this um trophy of allyship to ourselves and is it our place to say that we're an ally is it our place to say that we're we're doing wholly the right thing because again are we not just using our privilege to put ourselves center stage and to pat ourselves on the back for all the work we're doing um because beforehand i'd have said i was an ally because i'm actively going out of my way to do work to assess myself and that you know I've had a, an awakening if you will to the fact that I wasn't doing enough and now I am so I'm an ally but 
I'd be hesitant now after the reading groups to say I was because of everything yeah, I've just said. Yeah, that's such a good point, Faye. Um, who is policing allyship? Who gets to set the standards? Do we? Does the I? And isn't that inherently contradictory? You know, who sets the standards for, for allyship? And is is it just tokenistic? Is it this badge that we give ourselves? And I, I'm really interested in what you said around allyship as a concept being inherently kind of um, problematic. So it, it creates this dichotomy of good and white people or good and bad feminists, whereas actually most of us are probably a mixture of the two. I, I recommend all listeners to read um, Roxane Gay's uh, Bad Feminist. Um, she captures this nuance brilliantly. Um, thank you so much, Faye. Uh, Amy, do you have anything to say on this question? So can we truly be allies? Um, <laughs> I think Faye hits it on the head um, and relatively well. Um, as far as I think the focus of of allyship, if 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 that's the goal, um, even there, this this there's this odd dichotomy in a, in a mixture between what is what is good allyship and what is bad allyship. Um, several things. One, you, you're right. No one, if you're not if you're not a person of color, you're never going to understand that experience. That's not necessary to participate in anything that that pushes um you know equal you know fair fair policy and measures for equality and equity. That's that's just not required. Um, you, you don't have to be from those groups to to want fairness. Um, what I think should be a measurement and, and particularly a focus of that measurement of instead of looking at the fo kind of this, this white savior mentality is what do I do as a good white person, which is fundamentally flawed. It is a savior argument is flawed within it itself is what do you do to have a fair society? And as a deviance researcher, I would argue, look at the most underprivileged groups in that society and fight for policy and reform and, and advocate for those groups. Because if those groups start receiving and getting the benefit of a fair and equitable society, then everything else theoretically is connected to that as well, structurally. And we can always measure the um, the, the strength or the failures of a society by how its, uh, how its most vulnerable members are treated and the policies that reflect that treatment. Um, so if I, I think if you're going to direct your focuses towards anything, we already know Black people, uh, you know, people of color are going to be at the bottom end. We already know transgenders are going to be in those circles. We already know lone parents are going to be in those circles. We know this. So, And we have the data to provide evidence for that. So we should use that data to push for policy, to push for equity and 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 equal, and equal resources whatever when whatever forms that may be so it, it, i don't think it's really about do which which area do i support most which how do i prove i'm not racist because again the focus again is still on you it's how do you make an equitable and an equal society and you already know the most underprivileged groups are going to be contending with those issues the most hence hence those are the areas that you should look at to make sure that there are equal measures and equitable measures to 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 provide evidence for 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 those pushes and those and those in those right directions. So as, as far as being a member of the group, you're, you're not just like, we're never going to be white. And, and that's the reality of the situation. Welcome to kind of our position as well, where we're never going to be seen as white. We're never going to be treated as equal. We're always going to be something other. And I think the focus shouldn't be, well, I'm not a member of the group. I can't participate. Pay. It's, well, if anything, you're a privileged member. And as a privileged member, we, I would like to see more of your participation and in a, in a way that's equitable for the most underprivileged groups. And if that's balanced and if, and if that's the focus of that balance, then, then I think that's, that's going in the right direction. Um, but I don't think fundamentally anything's quote wrong with a, with with working towards that end goal if it's called allyship so be it if it's labeled something else so be it i don't really care what, what the box is wrapped with as long as that's the focus and if that is the focus then you fundamentally will provide um support for those groups and for yourself as well i think something that's missing in the argument of allyship is the fact that you know here is this that white people have to underprivilege themselves have to make themselves uncomfortable is there is there discomfort a part of it? Absolutely, but the fact that you're going to be underprivileged is it? That's a myth. There's no way that's going to happen. What there is is there's going to be equitable and and equal measures, and that doesn't mean you're underprivileged. It just means other people are kind of hopefully theoretically will be where you are. That doesn't take away 
from equity is equity. I know, I know equality is, is, is equality. It's about fairness. So I think the language of allyship, if, if that, if that's the term you guys, that the group wants to use should be focused on, on that and not shy away from the fact that, that, that this, that it's going to focus on people of color. It's going to focus on transgender. It's going to focus on, 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 on underprivileged sexual orientated or, or orientated groups and lone parents in particular. So I, I that, that's my uh, notion on it. It's not about you being in or out it's really about well what are you doing with your privilege that's ensuring that there's equality as we move forward and and we can measure that equal we can measure that um, successfully by looking at the most underprivileged groups of our society and i think that's a that's a significant place yeah i think that's a great point that we shouldn't um get too uh over occupied with the semantics of it uh with this kind of battle of of what terms we should use maybe that's also a bit of a kind of i don't know smoke and mirrors um, process. Um, and thank you for bringing up research, Amy, how we as researchers and academics maybe have a responsibility to be projecting the voices of the most marginalized. But again, how do we do that with, um, you know, a positionality of, of whiteness and also um, research that looks at marginalized groups is not fashionable and not well funded. So that really is um an upwards hill battle in terms of yeah. creating change, you know, yeah. policy change or academic change um, from from our perspectives in terms of what we can do within our fields. It's so hard because if you do a topic on, you know, critical race studies or feminism, it's likely not to be funded. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'd just like to finish on, um, I, I do think it's it's so hard to know what to do because I, I've, over the recent weeks, been feeling like, well, whatever I do, it's wrong. Whatever I do, it's problematic and is riddled with mistakes and centers my own whiteness. What's the point? And I've, I've found myself, actually, sometimes these processes of self-reflection, they're necessary, but sometimes they can actually, and this is quite scary to admit, they can go into quite unhelpful territory where I'm like, where it spirals down to the point where, what if I can't do anything without centering my own whiteness? So, so what's the point? And, you know, the BLM movement is saying that we need to, and, and anti-racist campaigners are saying we need to utilize our platform and our privilege and our voice and our institutional and structural power and privilege to, um, you know, uh, springboard the voices of the marginalized and, um, you know, put ourselves in in um, the path of danger, whether that's putting white female bodies at the front of, of protests or using our voice to get to gain certain uh, benefits for the BLM and anti-racist movements. But it's so hard, again, to do that without centering yourselves. And I think what we're looking for in these processes of painful self-reflection is like this one totalized answer. We want to look to like a person or a policy like, oh, where's the guidance for us to do this allyship thing properly? But we don't possess that. And movements are messy and diverse and have a mixture of messages coming out of them. You know, I've heard some people from the movement saying, the role of white people is to sit down and shut up and get out of the way. And then other people are saying, no, please come in. Your role is to protect and uplift and, and you know, weaponize your privilege. So I, I think that it's, it's really, really hard to know um, what to do and who is an authority on what good allyship looks like. And I think to listeners, it might, they might say, well, I know, you know, what good allyship looks like. But but do you? And where have you got that doctrine from? What's the origin of, of that? But I think, um, yeah, a question I'd like to leave my participants with today and listeners is, you know, how can we engage in these processes of self-reflection without self-flagellating and without coming to this really hopeless place of like, well, I have no uh, role to play in this. Sometimes you can almost like diminish yourself out of the conversation and, you know, spiral yourself out of it and think, well, there's no hope and there's no point and anything I do is going to be inherently contradictory. How do we strike that balance of self-reflection without um, kind of excluding uh, ourselves and, you know, uh, being punitive towards ourselves. So thank you so much, um, Amy and Faye, for engaging in this conversation. Uh, I'm really keen to do further reading group series. I think in the kind of uh, the discussions that are going on at the moment around JK Rowling and transgender rights and um, the gender 
uh, reforms at governmental level that are going on. I'd really love to maybe do the same, you know, looking in the mirror series, but for um, for feminists on the issue of transgender um, inclusion, because um, I don't know about you, but I thought I was educated and yet I still feel my back going up at certain points in the conversation. And I still feel myself going, oh, well, maybe sex-based rights act- activists do have a few points. And I'm like, and then I go back round to, no, Poppy, that that they're transphobic and you know I think that would be really really interesting to um to have as a looking in the mirror exercise uh, so do you have anything final you'd like to say Amy and, or Faye uh, any reading suggestions any any final comments um yeah <laughs> um if you're going if you if you want if you, you need a place to start if you're going to be focusing on these things. Um, obviously, anything by Kimberly Crenshaw, intersectionality. Um, uh, what's her name? Karathis? C-A-R-A-T-H-A-I-S. She's an intersectionally re- intersectionality researcher, but she also looks at the notion of um, uh, migration status, so immigration status, nationality as well. Um, she's she's quite interesting. But also the critique of intersectionality. There's a, there's a critique on intersectionality um, that it, it, um, offered by Patricia Hill Collins that it's been used as a token in and of itself by white feminists um, that it's a place to like to, to just, just have a conversation about it is enough. And that, in fact, it undermines the very concept of, of intersectionality. It's really about what are you doing with it? Are you hiring people of color? How many people of color are in your department? Um, are you is it, what does diversity really look like? Are you actually having these types of conversations, Poppy, which I think are wonderful? Are you having these conversations with your white members of your of, of um of of your departments and of your communities and is in, and, and make sure it's not being facilitated always by a black person always by a person of color because this is the work that you need to be doing and this is not really about making you feel better this is about you know decolonial decolonialization and, and, and you know and, and just dismantling the status quo of what's around us so i would encourage those types of readings absolutely um yeah, though that those are the women of color that come to me that I think are quite poignant and they offer a different perspective on sexuality and sexual orientation and the matrix of kind of those different those, those different spaces within the intersectional framework. Thanks so much, Amy. Well, listeners will be leaving you with a list of reading suggestions underneath the, the podcast to delve into uh, after this uh, conversation. Faye, do you have anything that you would like to leave our listeners with? Um so I've just started reading Audre Lorde, um, Your Silence Will Not Protect perfect. You. Hmm? Perfect, perfect. It's a great, it's well, a great text. Yeah, it's, well, the UK for a very long time didn't have uh, a text that, like, um, put together all of her works. So I'd recommend reading that because I think it covers a lot of issues. Um, Can We All Be Feminists? I thought was an incredibly insightful um, piece of literature because it took essays from lots of different women and put them all into one book for you to read and you can get, you know, an array of perspectives and things to take away and learn from it. Um, And then I think just as feminists, um, if you haven't read Invisible Women, that you should, um, because that, um, whilst not explicitly intersectional does delve into um issues of class and um like certain areas and that just covers so much um the issues that people can face and then you know take it upon yourself after reading invisible women to think about the areas that it's been presented and think does this go further for people of color and use that as a basis for your learning um, i found it an incredibly um upsetting and angering book because it's you know largely the discrimination that we face um but it was wholly worthwhile reading and is so well um researched so yeah those those would be my three recommendations audrey lord can we all be feminists and invisible women
Thank you so much, Faye. Yes, a lot of our reading um, in this area can be very painful and upsetting. Um, I'm actually interested in offsetting a little bit of that in one of my women's circles, upcoming women's circles, looking at um, uh, feminist joy. Uh, I think we spend a lot of our time as feminists in these kind of deep, depressing, dark places. Um, so I'm interested in where do we find joy um, in our feminist activism? and lives uh, so thank you very much um, Amy and Faye uh, you've been listening to the Difficult Conversations podcast series with me Poppy see you next time thank you bye thank you